In this lecture, we will be discussing skin disorders. As we age, our skin also changes. A few changes that occur include the following. Loss of elastic fibers, which can cause wrinkling. Melanocytes decrease, so there's less protection from UV rays. The dermis thins, and it causes the skin to become paper thin and sometimes translucent. Atrophy of the glands causes the skin to be more dry. Also, you have a decreased immune response. And the loss of melanocytes in the hair bulbs cause graying. The number of hair follicles start to thin and cause balding. And the temperature regulation becomes compromised. Clinical manifestations of skin dysfunctions are lesions, which can be broken down into primary, secondary, and other. And also another clinical manifestation is pruritus, which is itching. When we're talking about primary lesions, we're talking about a lesion that results from skin disease process by itself. It has not been altered by outside manipulation, treatment, or the natural course of the disease, and it may be present from birth. An example of a primary lesion is a vesicle. A secondary lesion is a lesion that has been altered by things such as an outside manipulation, treatment, or natural course of the disease. Going back to primary lesions, a few examples of primary lesions include macula, papule, patch, plaque, will, nodule, tumor, vesicle, bola, pustule, cyst, and tense vegetation. A secondary lesion is a lesion that has been altered by things such as an outside manipulation, treatment, or natural course of a disease. Going back to primary lesions, a few examples of primary lesions include macule, papule, patch, plaque, will, nodule, tumor, vesicle, bola, pustule, cyst, and tamagectasia. For the next couple of slides, we are going to be discussing different primary lesions. A macule. A description of a macule is flat, circumscribed, discoloration of skin, less than one centimeter in diameter. Examples include freckles, flat moles, fatigia, measles, and scarlet fever. A papule can be described as elevated, firm, circumscribed area, less than one centimeter in diameter. Examples are warts, elevated moles, and lichen planus. A patch is flat, non-palpable, irregular shaped macule that is more than one centimeter in diameter. Examples include vitiligo. A patch is flat, non-palpable, irregular shaped macule. It's more than one centimeter in diameter. Examples include vitiligo, port wine stain, Mongolian spot, A patch is flat, non-palpable, and it's an irregular shaped macule. It's more than one centimeter in diameter. Examples include vitiligo, port wine stains, Mongolian spots, and cafe au lait spots. A plaque is elevated, firm, and it's a rough lesion with flat top surface. It's more than one centimeter in diameter. Examples include seboric and acnic keratosis and psoriasis. A will 
is elevated and it's an irregular shaped area of cutaneous edema. It's solid and translucent and it's got a variable diameter. Examples include allergic reactions, insect bites, and urticaria. A nodule is elevated, firm, and it's a circumscribed lesion. It's deeper in the dermis than a papule. It's usually about one to two centimeters in diameter, and examples include erythema, nodosum, and lipomas. A tumor is elevated, a solid lesion, which may be clearly demarcated deeper in the dermis. It's more than two centimeters in diameter. Examples include neoplasms, B9 tumor, lipoma, and hemangioma. A vesicle is elevated, circumscribed, superficial, it's not into the dermis, and it's filled with serous fluid. It's less than one centimeter in diameter. Examples are chicken pox and herpes zoster. A bulla is a vesicle that is more than one centimeter in diameter. Example is a blister. A pustule is elevated and it's a superficial lesion. It's similar to a vesicle, but it's filled with purulent fluid. Examples include acne and impetigo. A cyst is an elevated, circumscribed, encapsulated lesion. It's in the dermis or the subcutaneous layer. It's filled with liquid or semi-solid material. Examples include cystic acne and sebaceous cyst. The laryngitasia are fine, irregular red lines produced by capillary dilation. Examples include the telangiasia and rosacea. For the next few slides, we're going to be discussing secondary lesions. Examples include scale, lichenification, keloid, scar, excoriation, fissure, erosion, ulcer, and atrophy. Now, when it comes to talking about a scale, it can be described as heaped up, flaky skin. It also has keratinized cells, and it's irregular, thick or thin, dry or oily, and it's a variation in size. An example, I'm sorry, examples include seborrheic, dermatitis, drug reaction, dry skin, and dandruff. Lichenification can be described as rough, thickened skin. It's usually the epidermis layer. It's secondary to persistent rubbing, itching, or skin irritation. It often involves a flexor surface of an extremity. An example would include a clonic dermatitis reaction. A keloid can be described as an irregular shape. Elevated, progressively enlarging scar. It grows beyond the boundaries of the wound, and it's usually caused by excessive collagen formation during healing. In other words, overgrowth of scar tissue. Examples include keloid formation following surgery. It can be caused from an ear piercing or skin trauma that resulted in a cut. A scar is thin to thick fibrous tissue that replaces normal skin following an injury or a laceration to the dermis. An example is a healed wound or surgical incision. Excoriation can be described as loss of the epidermis and it's a linear hollowed out crusted area. Examples include abrasions or scratch and scabies. A fissure can be described as a linear crack or break from the epidermis to the dermis. It may be moist or dry 
and examples include athlete's foot and cracks at the corner of the mouth. An erosion is a loss of part of the epidermis. It's depressed, moist, glistening, and it follows a rupture of a vesicle or bulla. Examples include varicella or variola after a rupture or a blister after a rupture. An ulcer can be described as loss of epidermis and dermis. It's concave and it varies in size. Examples include a decubitus ulcer and a stasis ulcer. Atrophy can be described as thinning of the skin surface and loss of skin markings. The skin appears translucent and paper-like. Examples include aged skin and striate, which can occur after pregnancy. Other types of skin lesions include comedone, frolic, petechia, purpura, and ehrlosis. A comedone can be described as a plug of sebaceous cysts and keratin material lodged in the opening of a hair follicle. An open comedone has a dilated orifice. This is also called a blackhead. A closed comedone has a narrow opening. This is also called a whiteness. A burrow can be described as narrow, raised, irregular channel caused by a parasite. Petechia can be described as circumscribed area of blood less than 0.5 centimeters in diameter. Purpurea is a circumscribed area of blood more than 0.5 centimeters in diameter. And ecchymosis is another name for a bruise and it's a large hemorrhagic spot. When you are evaluating skin problems, you want to make sure that you look carefully at the lesions and you want to try to determine if it's primary or secondary. You also want to palpate the lesion, observe the distribution and pattern, and also you want to look at the skin, the nails, the hair, and the mucous membranes. Obtaining a history and review of systems, you want to get the following information. Onset and duration of the skin lesions. Is it continuous or in intermittent? Pattern of eruption. Where did it start and what did it look like then? You want to know if there's any known precipitants, such as allergies. And you also want to know about skin symptoms and systemic symptoms and if they have any underlying illnesses and also family history. Lab tests that you might consider ordering on a patient with a skin problem are as followed. Microscopy, cultures, VDRL, and ANA, an ultraviolet light exam, and sometimes a surgical biopsy might be necessary. Treatment measures, for medical treatment, you may prescribe a topical or systemic corticosteroid, an antibiotic, an antifungal agent, or an antiviral agent. Surgical treatments may include shaving the skin, punch grafting, elliptical excision, scissor excisions, cryosurgery or electrosurgery. Common skin disorders include benign skin, benign neoplasms, pre-malignant, malignant skin disorders, infectious diseases, scaling disorders, and bullous disorders. Other skin disorders include inflammatory disorders, papulosquamous, vesicular bolus, infections, vascular disorders, insect bites and parasites, tumors, and cancer. Eczema is a type of inflammatory disorder. There are several different categories. There's atopic, 
seborrheic, irritant contact, allergic contact, and status dermatitis. When we are talking about inflammation of skin, we are referring to dermatitis. As mentioned earlier, eczema is categorized as different types of dermatitis. Usually, just eczema is the diagnosis for a patient when a specific cause of inflammation cannot be identified. Eczema is the most common inflammatory disorder. It's an inflammatory response caused by an endogenous and exogenous agent. Atopic, sabor, and stasis dermatitis are caused by endogenous agents. Irritant and allergy type dermatitis is caused by an exogenous agent. The next few slides are going to review atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is a type of eczematous eruption that is itchy, recurrent, and symmetric. It's often found on the flexor surfaces. Patients often have a personal or family history of asthma, allergic rhinitis, or eczema. It's not due to a specific antigen. Usually there's multiple triggers in patients with strong genetic predisposition to eczematous eruptions. Usually interaction of allergens with the immune system results in chronic inflammation. The clinical presentation of atopic dermatitis includes intense itching that leads to scratching, eczematous change, and lichenification. Lesions usually involve the neck, wrists, area behind the ears, the antecubital and popliteal flexor surfaces, and the lesions may even ooze, crust, and become purulent. Treatment is usually determining what the precipitant is and avoiding that, um, keeping the wet lesions dry, and keeping the dry lesions wet. Inflammation treated with corticosteroids is usually helpful. Now, when it comes to topical corticosteroids, a short course of higher potency types are good for flare-ups. You then want to reduce the potency to a lower dosage for control. The use of systemic corticosteroids are good for severe flare-ups. Oral antibiotics for secondary infections may be needed. And examples of these type of antibiotics include erythromycin, or penicillin. Sometimes an antihistamine may need to be prescribed if Benadryl over the counter is not helping. In examples, Adorex, and usually the dosage is 25 milligrams as needed and at bedtime. This antihistamine you do want to avoid giving in elderly people because of their side effects. Seborrheic dermatitis is a common chronic inflammatory disorder of the skin involving the scalp, eyebrows, eyelids, air canals, nasal, labial folds, axilla, chest, and back. In infants, it's called the cradle cap. Lesions can appear starting in infancy through elderly age. Um, there can be remissions and exacerbations. Signs and symptoms include scaly, white, or yellowish inflammatory plaques with mild pruritus. Stasis dermatitis usually occurs on the legs as a result of venous stasis and edema. It's associated with varicosities, phlebitis, and vascular trauma. Signs and symptoms include erythema, pruritus, then scaling 
petechia, hyperpigmentation, and it may ulcerate. It is a common inflammatory skin disease of the lower extremities in patients with chronic venous insufficiency. The medial ankle is most frequently and severely involved because this area has relatively a poor blood flow compared with the rest of the leg. Lesions are erythematous. They're scaly. Eczematous patches may result in exudative weeping patches and plaques. Treatment for stasis dermatitis may include a dermatology referral. Other treatments include compression devices such as TED hoses. Lesions are wet, so the use of drying agents are helpful. Topical corticosteroids may be prescribed to treat the inflammation. And since um, these kind of Skin infections are prone, I'm sorry, skin disorders are prone to infection. It can lead to cellulitis, which you may treat with antibiotics. Next, we're going to talk about irritant contact dermatitis, which is a non-immunologically mediated inflammation. Causes include chemical irritation from acids, prolonged exposure to soaps, detergents, and chemicals. Signs and symptoms include erythema, swelling, itching, and vesicular lesions. The pathogenesis includes or involves alteration of the outer layers of the dermis due to exposure to chemicals, lotions, cold or dry air, soaps, detergents, and organic solvents. Allergic contact dermatitis is a cell-mediated, delayed, hypersensitivity immune response. An example includes poison ivy. Sensitization develops with the first exposure. Symptoms occur several hours after re-exposure. Signs and symptoms include erythema, swelling, itching, and vesicular lesions, which are similar to the irritant contact dermatitis. The pathogenesis of allergic contact dermatitis involves the alteration in the epidermis when after exposure to the allergen. The immune system responds by producing inflammation in the cutaneous tissue. Common allergens include poison ivy, poison oak, sumac, nickel jewelry, hair dye, rubber and leather, chemicals, cleaning supplies, soaps, and topical medications. Other clinical presentations of allergic contact dermatitis may include red swollen blisters, which may be linear in formation. The treatment includes removal of the offending agent. A lukewarm bath may help, and you can suggest products such as Aveeno which can be found over the counter. Calamine lotion may be suggested. Hydrocortisone cream. Lidex ointment, which is a higher potency corticosteroid. Adorex, which is an antihistamine, which may help with the itching if Benadryl is not helping with the improvement of their symptoms. And again, you want to avoid prescribing Adorex in the elderly just because of the side effects. If it is very severe, you may want to consider oral steroids such as prednisone. And you really want to watch for secondary infections such as impetigo. The following PowerPoint slides are going to discuss papulosquamous disorders, which include psoriasis, lichen planus, acne vulgaris, acne rosacea, discoid lupus, erythematosus, systemic lupus, erythematosus. So the first one we're going to discuss is psoriasis. 
This is a chronic relapsing proliferative skin disorder. The cause is unknown. It's often family it's often related to a family history or human leukocyte antigen associated inheritance. It affects the dermis and the epidermis, which is usually thickened with cellular hyperproliferation with an altered differentiation and inflammation. The epidermis is shed every three to four days. In psoriasis, there is an increased number of germinative cells, also an increase in transit time through the dermis, which all does not allow time for cell to mature and keratinization to occur. This results in thickened epidermis and plaque formation. The dermis and epidermis are both thickened with cellular hyperproliferation, altered differentiation, and infl inflammation. Signs and symptoms that you may see in patients with psoriasis include well demarcated skin that is thick, silvery, scaly, erythematous plaque surrounded by normal skin most commonly occurs on the face, scalp, elbows, knees, and sites of trauma. Sometimes the nails are affected. The extensor surfaces of the arms and the legs are the most affected. Psoriasis treatment. The treatment for psoriasis is aimed at controlling the symptoms, not curing, because it is a chronic disease that requires long-term treatment. For mild to moderate symptoms, a topical steroid is usually the first line of therapy. If the scalp is involved, use of a coal tar shampoo in place of regular shampoo twice a week may be beneficial for a patient. For the face and skin folds, hydrocortisone cream 1% may also be beneficial. Treatment for the body, arms, and legs may require a steroid cream, such as Aristocort cream, which can be used twice a day. Psoriasis can be managed in the PCP's office. However, a dermatology referral might be considered if there are, is more than 20% of their body involved, if they have pustular psoriasis. The overall goal is to control the disease, but also to reassure the patient that there are a variety of treatment options. Approximately 10% of patients with psoriasis may develop psoriatic arthritis, which can sometimes be debilitating and um, require systemic treatment. Treatment with immune modulators such as methotrexate, Humira, Enbrel, and Remicade may be a few types of medications that might be prescribed. And a referral to a rheumatologist for extensive management may be needed to be considered as well. Lichen planus is a benign inflammatory disorder of the skin and mucous membrane. The cause is unknown, however, several factors that may contribute to the disorder include an immune system attack, certain medications or exposure to film processing chemicals. Signs and symptoms include non-scaling, violet-colored pruritic papules that may be 2 to 10 millimeters in size, usually found on the wrists, ankles, lower legs, and genitalia area. The papules can be described as flat-topped, polygonal in shape with central depression. On the mucous membranes, you may see lacy white rings, which may eventually ulcerate. The lesions average a duration of 12 to 18 months. Acne vulgaris is a very common skin disease. It develops in the sebaceous follicles. There are two different categories. There's non-inflammatory, which are the open comedones, and the inflammatory, which is when the comedones are closed.
The treatment for mild acne vulgaris usually involves a topical one. An example would be benzoyl peroxide or T-stat. Treatment for moderate acne vulgaris includes one of the topical meds plus one of the following oral meds. Tetracycline, erythromycin, clindamycin, Bactrim single strength, or oral contraceptives. For severe acne vulgaris, which involves a nodulocystic and or inflammatory acne, would require a dermatology referral for management. Usually the follow-up for acne vulgaris is every six to eight weeks. Medications may need to be adjusted according to the irritation and also oral antibiotics may need to be tapered. As far as education on patients with acne vulgaris, you want to make sure that they have a proper cleansing routine that they do twice a day, preferably in the morning and at night. And you also want to reassure the patients that therapeutic results are not achieved immediately. For females, you want to let them know that they need to avoid use of oil-based cosmetics. And also, you want to tell the patients that they need to eat a well-balanced diet. Three key components to remember about acne rosacea include, number one, the tendency to flush easily, especially in response to triggers. Number two, pimples. And number three, hyperplasia of the nose. Treatment for rosacea includes identifying and avoiding the triggers. The drug of choice is tetracycline. Other medications that may be prescribed include erythromycin, doxycycline, ampicillin, and flagyl. Topical antibiotics may also be prescribed. You want to monitor these patients every two weeks, then every two to four weeks as their symptoms improve. Discoid lupus erythematosus. Discoid lupus erythematosus may be a type of SLE with cutaneous manifestations as the only symptom. It is aggravated by sun exposure. It is diagnosed by skin biopsy. Signs and symptoms include lesions that can be single and there's multiple of various sizes on light exposed areas of the skin and there's also usually a butterfly lesion on the face. Other signs and symptoms include an early lesion that may be asymmetric with one to two centimeters raised with a red plaque with a brownish scale. The scale usually penetrates the hair follicle and leaves a carpet tack appearance when it is removed. In the last months, these lesions may resolve or cause atrophy. They usually heal from the center out with residual telangiectasia and scarring. Sometimes they have a depressed scar. Hair lesions may lead to alopecia. Systemic lupus erythematous is a chronic inflammatory immune complex disorder that may affect the skin as well as other major body organs. There is a strong genetic component with altered cellular immunity and auto-antibody production. Next, we are going to be discussing vesiculobolus disorders. Pemphigus is an autoimmune blistering disease of the skin and oral mucous membranes. It's caused by circulating IgE antibodies. Pemphis vulgaris involves the epidermis separating above the basal layer with blistering formation. Usually the blisters rupture and they spread. Pemphigus fallacious and erythematosus has no oral lesions.
Bolus pemphigoid is more benign, and it usually occurs in patients over the age of 60. It is blistering of the subepidermal layer. It may begin as a localized erythema or pruritic plaque that extends and becomes edematous. It turns a reddish purple in about two to three weeks with vesicles and bullae emerging on the surface. Blisters rupture, but heal rapidly. Erythema multiform is an acute recurrent inflammatory disorder of the skin and mucous membranes. It is often associated with allergic or toxic reactions to drugs or microorganisms. Edema develops leading to formation of vesicles and bulla. A common characteristic of this disorder includes a bull's eye or target lesions. Steven Johnson syndrome is the most common form in children and young adults. It is caused by a drug reaction. In this disorder, there are severe bolus formations, which involve both skin and mucous membranes. The bolus lesions are from erosions and crust when they rupture. Mouth air passages, esophagus, urethra, and the conjunctivi may be involved. They may also have corneal ulceration, which can result in blindness. Mild forms last approximately 10 to 14 days. When talking about skin disorders, there are several categories of infectious disorders. These include bacterial, examples are folliculitis, furuncles, and carbuncles. There is viral, which includes herpes virus, molluscum, warts, rubella, and then there's fungal, which includes yeast. Folliculitis is a bacterial infection of the hair follicle. A common cause is from staph aureus. The lesions usually present as pustules with surrounding area of erythema. It is most commonly found on the scalp, face in men, and extremities. It may look like acne with pus-filled pimples. On the face, it can be caused by curly, coarse hair, commonly from a beard, that grows into the size of the hair follicles following shaving. It occurs more frequently in men with darker skin types. Treatment for folliculitis includes proper hygiene. For mild cases, Bactroban ointment to the affected area may be prescribed. As far as antibiotics that are taken orally, these may include erythromycin or cephalaxin. For severe cases, antibiotics that may be prescribed include Cipro, Afloxacin, and if MRSA is suspected, Scepter DS may be prescribed. Furuncles and carbuncles. A furuncle is a boil that develops from preceding folliculitis with a spread through follicular wall into the surrounding dermis. The lesions usually present as deep, firm, red, in a painful nodule that's approximately one to five centimeters in diameter and changes to a large, fluctuant, and tender cystic nodule that may be accompanied by cellulitis. Carbuncles are a collection of hair, I'm sorry, a collection of infected hair follicles. The treatment for furuncles is the same kind of antibiotics as for folliculitis. However, it may require an incision and drainage. If you do suspect MRSA, which is um, becoming more increasingly common, it is recommended that you culture for this organism to be certain. Antibiotic treatment for suspected MRSA or confirmed MRSA requires first-line treatment with Bactrim unless they're allergic. 
Cellulitis is an infection of the dermis and subcutaneous tissue, usually caused by staph. It can occur as an extension of a skin wound, an ulcer, or from furuncles or carbuncle. The infected area is erythematous, swollen, and painful. Treatment of cellulitis depends upon the location and extent of tissue involved. If it is localized and on the torso or extremities, oral antibiotics, warm soaks, and elevation may be beneficial and enough. If it's more extensive or on the head, a patient may need IV antibiotics and possible hospital admission. In the next few slides, we're going to discuss viral infections. Herpes simplex virus is a viral infection. There are six types, HSV1, HSV2, CMV, varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr, and human herpes virus, which is HHV6. HSV1 is commonly called cold sore and usually causes an infection of the cornea and the mouth. HSV2 usually has genital lesions. The herpes virus penetrates cutaneous tissue and it establishes in the sensory nerve ganglion, innervating the site. Primary infection is asymptomatic. Incubation is 2 to 14 days. Clinical symptoms last one to three weeks, viral shedding for two to six weeks. The virus remains dormant within sensory or autonomic ganglion and can lead to recurrence. HSV-1. Lesions can be described as a rash or clusters of inflamed and painful vesicles within the mouth, over the tongue, lips, around the nose. There is increased sensitivity, paresthesias, and mild burning, which may occur before the onset of a lesion. Vesicles do rupture, forming a crust. The lesions can last two to six weeks. Usually a concurrent URI is common. As discussed earlier, the clinical presentation for HSV-1 include vesicular lesions with surrounding erythema. This can progress to ulcers, which crust and re-epithelize over days to weeks. This can affect the whole mouth, accompanied by fever, chills, or malaise. Treatment includes comfort measures, um, lidocaine, biscuit, or Benadryl elixir may be beneficial. Medications for pain, such as Tylenol. A cyclovir is usually the antiviral that's prescribed. However, there are other options. And there's also ointment that can be prescribed, such as Zolvarex. HSV-2 consists of lesions that can be described as small vesicles that progress to ulceration within three to four days with pain, itching, and weeping. It can be transmitted to a baby during vaginal delivery. Antivirals such as acyclovir can help to decrease new lesion formation and promote healing. Herpes varicella and zoster are caused by the same herpes virus which is the varicella zoster virus. Varicella, known as chickenpox, is a primary infection, and zoster, known as shingles, follows years later. Herpes zoster can be described as an eruption of the virus along the dermatome. The initial signs and symptoms include pain, paresthesias, along the dermatome. It is usually followed by vesicular eruptions along a facial, cervical, or thoracic lumbar dermatome. Early treatment reduces severity.
Herpes zoster is more common in adults and elderly. It is caused by reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, which has been lying dormant in the dorsal root ganglia of a dermatome. Stress is known to cause reactivation. Clinical presentation of herpes zoster includes the prodrome phase where there's itching, burning, and a tingling sensation or pain prior to the eruption of late lesion. Active includes malaise, fever, headache, pruritic rash. Um, it's usually unilateral, painful, um, with a vesicular eruption distributed over a dermatome of an infected nerve root. The thoracic and cervical spinal dermatomes are often involved. The most common dermatome affected by herpes zoster includes the face. Patients may come in and complain of a toothache, earache, or numbness of the tongue. If the lesions do extend into the eye, this is a concern because it's dangerous because it can lead to blindness. Treatment for herpes zoster. Early intervention can make a big difference. Antiviral agents may be prescribed, such as acyclovir. Comfort measures are often very important as well. Medications for pain that patients can try over the counter include Tylenol. However, sometimes they may require something stronger for pain. Now, if the eye is involved, a referral to an ophthalmologist immediately is very important. Patients may follow up as needed. Recommending the vaccine is very important. It is available to prevent recurrence in patients, especially those at high risk. Post-herpetic neuralgia is a complication of herpes zoster. It can include continuing pain, which may be severe after eruption of the lesion has resolved. In this case, you may want to consider prescribing medications such as Lyrica. And also, you may want to consider a dermatology referral. Warts are benign lesions that are caused by HPV. They can be described as round, elevated with a gray surface, and can occur anywhere. They are transmitted by touch. Verruca vulgaris are common warts, and they're on the fingers. Plantar warts are found um, on the pressure points on the soles. Condylomata acuminata are genital warts. They are highly contagious, and they have a cauliflower appearance. Molluscum contendiosum are dome-shaped papules with dimpled or belly button shape. They are common in children and young adults and immunocompromised individuals. They are caused by pox virus. They can be treated with a curatage or liquid nitrogen which are most commonly the way to treat them. And sometimes they may spontaneously resolve. For the next few slides, we're gonna be discussing fungal infections. Tinea is ringworm. When we're referring to the foot, we call it tinea pedis. Tinea capitis refers to the scalp. Tinea corporis refers to the body. A diagnostic test that can be used for confirmation of tinea includes gathering skin scrapings from the site and using KOH and observing it under a microscope. Thrush is another type of fungal infection which is caused by Candida albicans. Treatment for tinea includes topical azoles such as clotramazole or myconazole. Treatment for tinea capitis, however, may have to include an oral 
antifungal. If they are prescribed an oral antifungal, they do have to have routine CBC, renal, and hepatic labs drawn. For the next few slides, we're going to discuss insect bites and parasites. The first disease we will look at is Lyme disease. This is caused by a bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, that's transmitted to humans through a bite from an infected black-legged or deer tick. It must be attached for at least 24 hours. Symptoms can occur anywhere from 3 to 30 days after the initial bite. Symptoms can be wide-ranging depending on the stage of the infection. Early signs and symptoms include fever, chills, headache, fatigue, muscle and joint pain, and swollen lymph nodes. In about 70 to 80% of the infections, a rash is seen, and about 30% of those rashes have a bull's eye appearance. Treatment includes antibiotics, such as amoxicillin, tetracycline. You also want to treat the symptoms that patients may be presenting, which include supportive measures. When treated early in the infection stage, a full recovery is most likely. Spider bite. A black widow spider bite initially feels like a pinprick that lasts for a short time and then subsides, but within a half hour, severe abdominal cramps may begin. The abdomen becomes rigid. The venom in black widow spider bites is neurotoxic, which causes ascending paralysis. Treatment for this type of bite is an antivenom and then symptomatic treatment. The black widow spider bite can go unnoticed, although it often produces an immediate sharp pinprick pain, a slight swelling and redness that may develop at the bite side. The widow spiders as mentioned earlier, inject a neurotoxin. Muscle and chest pain or tightness are some of the most common reactions to the widow toxin. Abdominal pain, cramping, and nausea also occur. And other general symptoms include restlessness, anxiety, breathing, and speech difficulty, along with sweating. With the black widow spider bite, swelling may be noticed in extremities and eyelids, but rarely at the bite site. Often there is a general sense of discomfort shortly after the bite, and acute symptoms increase in severity during the first day after a bite. Symptoms usually decline after two to three days, but some mild symptoms may continue for several weeks after recovery. Bites usually are non-fatal because of the small amount of venom injected. Another concerning spider bite is that from a brown recluse. A brown recluse spider bite causes a large deep area of necrosis at the site. It may have a bull's eye appearance. There may be a severe local reaction. It is seldom fatal. Treatment is symptomatic. A brown recluse bite may have an initial sharp sting or no immediate pain. Pain may develop within the first several hours after being bitten 
and it may possibly become severe. Signs and symptoms of this type of bite include general feeling of discomfort, malaise, or nausea, formation of an ulcer in the area of the bite, chills or fever, sweating, reddish to purplish color to skin area around the bite, itching, or a red or purplish blister. Scabies. Scabies are caused by an itch mite and occur when eggs are deposited in the stratum corneum in a burrow. Signs and symptoms may appear as far out as three to five weeks later. The lesions are burrows, papules, vesicular lesions with severe itching that is worse at night. Secondary infections may occur and crusting may develop from scratching and eczematous changes. Pediculosis. Pediculosis capitis is another name for head lice. Pediculosis corporum is body lice. And thyrus pubis is pubic lice. For the next few slides, we're going to be discussing benign tumors. Seboric keratosis is a benign proliferation of the basal cells that produce smooth or warty elevated lesions. The color varies from waxy yellow to flesh colored to dark brown black. They are a few millimeter in size to several millimeters in size. They can be oval greasy with hyperkeratonic scaly look. Usually on older people, multiple lesions can be found on the chest, back and face. Treatment is cryotherapy. Keratocanthoma is a benign self-limiting tumor arising from hair follicles. It resembles squamous cell cancer, and it can be in different stages. There's the proliferative stage, the mature stage, and the involution stage. Actinic keratosis is a pre-malignant lesion on the skin surfaces exposed to the sun. The area is a pigmented patch with rough adherent scaling. Surrounding area may have telangiectasia, and this is rare in black skin. Nevi, also known as moles, consists of pigmented or non-pigmented macular or papular form from melanocytes. It may undergo transition to a malignant melanoma. So it's important to monitor these. Basal cell carcinoma involves the surface epithelial tumor originating from undifferentiated basal or germinative cells. It begins as a nodule, pearly white or ivory in color, slightly elevated with small blood vessels on the surface. As it grows, the center becomes depressed. There are rolled borders, ulceration, it's firm to touch, and there are also, there's also a slow growth rate. It is the most common skin cancer in Caucasians. It usually occurs on the head and the neck where sun is exposed the most. As mentioned earlier, it's slow growing. It rarely metastasizes. It doesn't invade vessels. With each occurrence, the greater the risk of reoccurrence. And again, signs and symptoms include nodular, ulcerative, pigmented, or superficial appearance, usually whitish, brown, or black with poorly defined borders, seen on the face and other sun-exposed areas, and it's very slow growing. Squamous cell carcinoma is usually on the head and neck as well. It's a tumor of the epidermis, 
in situ or invasive. It's more malignant than basal cell. It can arise from pre-malignant lesions. In situ, usually confined to the epidermis, which may develop from actinic keratosis or areas of burns. The invasive are tumors that are firm, increase in size, and elevated. This may be granular and they bleed easily. It may develop from sun damaged skin. People with blue, gray, or green eyes are at a higher risk for developing squamous cell carcinoma. There are approximately 100,000 new cases each year. This type of skin cancer can ulcerate and invade nerves and metastasis is common. Malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma is the fastest growing cancer in the United States. The incidence doubles every 10 years. Risk factors include heredity, sun exposure, steroids, lighter skin, freckles, family history, and an occurrence of blistering sunburn before age 15. It is uncommon in African Americans and Asians. Common locations are hands, feet, eyes, and mucous membranes. Now, when talking about melanoma, it's important to observe the moles, as we mentioned earlier. Pre-malignant, color change, size change, irregular notched edge margin, itching, bleeding, or oozing, nodularity, scab formation, and ulceration are characteristics that should be observed in any kind of mole. It originates in melanocytes. The color usually varies within the lesion. It can be tan, brown, or blue-black. Large numbers of nevi or moles on individual consider strong markers for risk of having melanoma. There are four categories of melanoma. They are as followed, superficial spreading melanoma, nodular melanoma, lentigo, maligna melanoma, and acral lentiginous melanoma. Signs and symptoms of melanoma include pigmented lesion, which is usually brown, black, tan, blue, red, or white. The colors vary within the lesion. There is usually an asymmetrical with irregular border. Um, it's frequently uh, more than six millimeters in diameter. An ABCD approach to the inspection of the nevi can help. A stands for symmetry of the lesion. B, irregular border. C, variation of colors within the lesion. And D, diameter, more than six millimeters. E is sometimes added. E can refer to the elevation from flat to a raised lesion. Treatment of skin cancers. Diagnostic tests used to confirm skin cancer includes a biopsy of suspicious lesions. It is recommended that you refer all patients to a dermatologist when skin cancer is suspected. Moss microsurgery is a surgical procedure used to treat skin cancer. It allows an exam and removal of tissues at the same time and it causes less scarring. There is a high cure rate for basal and squamous cell cancers with this procedure. Patient education. You want to educate them on decreasing sun exposure which includes no tanning in the sun or in tanning beds. You want to encourage them to use sun blocking agents with the highest SPF, wear hats to help block out the sun, and you also want to educate patients on 
stealth skin exams. You want to teach patients what to look for that indicate need to see a healthcare provider. For example, you want them to be able to know what kind of characteristics to look out for on a mole that would cause a concern and want them to see their healthcare provider soon. The American Cancer Society recommends annual skin examinations for all adults over the age of 40 and to be completed by an experienced practitioner. It is important to carefully document findings. Kaposi sarcoma is a vascular malignancy. There are several causes which can in include immunosuppression, HIV, and CMV cofactors. The lesions can be described as purplish brown macules that develop into plaques and nodules. It can be pruritic and painful. Um, it's multifocal and usually first on the lower extremities. This completes the end of skin disorders. Thank you. This completes the lecture on skin disorders. Thank you.